I thought about what these men are being honored for, and it's their collaboration together. Uh, don't worry, I'll wrap things up soon. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I thought about my own small career, or my own short career, and I realized anything that I've done that's been halfway decent has been because of the collaboration I had with the people that I was doing it with, and how magical that was. And watching these two um, men, these two, these two artists, geniuses collaborate so beautifully um, without exaggeration was the most inspiring thing I ever got to witness so I want to I want to thank you guys for letting me watch that and um, I, it made me think you know ha have you ever been single you know when you're single you don't have a partner a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband or a wife and you go out with two friends of yours and they're this amazing couple and <laughs> you 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 leave the dinner and you go you go man I like I hope I end up in something like that one day you know um, and that you know um, and I thought about that concept and as an actor I hope to be lucky enough to find that partner in someone else like you two have found uh, with each other. <laughs> No, I'm, I don't mean it, you know, I don't, but, but I mean that genuinely. Um, so, thank you. <laughs> this is very surreal. Um, I want to thank you, um, my two heroes, for being uh, as amazing of men as you are artists. So, congratulations, and I love you guys. Thanks. Marty, when did you first see this guy on screen? Well, I think it was uh, uh, some scenes from This Boy's Life, but it was, bef it was after Robert De Niro told me, um, and by the way, I'm working with this young kid. He's really good. You should work with him sometime. His name is DiCaprio. And I said, okay. But he doesn't usually, especially at that time, what was that, how many years ago? What was it, 1990? Ninety-three or so, right around that time, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it was the, the last collaboration uh, I did there with the eighth film with De Niro was Casino. So after Casino, it's, it's been different in a sense. So uh, we don't see each other that often and that sort of thing. So it's um, for him to recommend somebody out of the blue that way to me on, on a phone call was something uh, very, very, uh, uh, very, very special. Uh, but the real, the real thing happened. I hadn't seen Gilbert Grape in a theater, but I happened to catch part of it on television, on uh, one of the, uh, uh, you know, film channels. But what, what, what it was about it myself, my wife, Helen, we were watching it, and I thought it was a documentary. I didn't think, I, I didn't know. I, I, I didn't recognize Johnny, the, the mother was great. Him, I, we were amazed by it, and I realized it's an actual, an actually a film, a, 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 fiction, a fiction film, in a sense a staged film, um, I should say. And so I then realized, that who's that boy? And then we saw the name, and that was the name that uh, De Niro had told me about. Um, and then he made Titanic. <laughs> which I had nothing to do with. Okay, let's get that clear. Um, I get seasick, I have nothing to do with it. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, at that point, uh, uh, it was a big crossroads in my career. I made Kundun and Bringing Out the Dead, and uh, uh, both films uh, uh, didn't do very well at the box office at that point, and things were changing, and Mike Ovitz came up to me and said, don't you want to make Gangs in New York? He said, I'm uh, working with these guys, and one of them is Leo DiCaprio, and he says, he happens to like your films. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is important, because, I mean, you know, it's... it's uh, uh, it's great to have um, an actor uh, who wants to work with you. And so um, they said, do you have the Gangs of New York script? And I said, yes, we did, but actually we didn't. We had some of it. And so we started that way. We met, you came on the set, I think, of Bringing Out the I'm Dead. Bringing Out the Dead. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we talked about working together on well, Gangs. We should uh, move on to uh, The Aviator. And uh, you can talk briefly, how did, how did, is this something you had talked about doing for a while beforehand? And I know there were other, other Howard Hughes projects and so on and so forth, but uh, um, did you just... It, have a meeting of minds about this and said, we're going to do this? How did, it, how did it come about? Well, basically, we had done Gangs of New York. We had a, you know, a, a really great relationship working there. And I, I had I'd picked up a book, I think, when I was 21 about Howard Hughes, and I really became obsessed with playing him. 
it was the sort of most you know fascinating character uh, you know I'd come across in a long time and and uh, so I, I developed a script Michael Mann actually developed it for a while and then he went off to do Ali and I was sitting there with this this screenplay and, and I remember sending it over in, to Marty in hopes that he'd be interested in it and you know I think his first uh, the first thing he said well look he doesn't know anything about aviation but he didn't know anything about boxing either and he did Rage and Bull so he's going to take <laughs> a look at I it. Don't know. So that was encouraging. And, um, and all, I know, yeah, all I know is I'm afraid of both. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that to me is one of the most nostalgic memories I have of really making a movie. To, for the first time, you know, having that responsibility of bringing material like this to a director of his stature and then sort of creating it and doing a makeshift Hollywood in, in Montreal, rebuilding Grauman's Chinese, the investigation of who this character was, creating this, you know, this, this sort of fasc fascinating look into his mind through the screening room and the, the, the confinement of that was, was really a, a, a miraculous part of my life. I've, I really, I'd never s sort of submerged myself, uh, I don't wanna say submerged myself as an actor, but really focused on absolutely nothing for eight, eight, nine months of my life than, than, than that film. I was so dedicated to that process and because I felt a real responsibility for, uh, for the movie for the first time. I'd always had a relationship, you know, you grow up in the industry is the director is your father, you follow your father's lead, you find your own way, but this is the first time I was like, oh, you know, here, Dad, this is something. That, <laughs> do you like it? <laughs> you know, let's, let's work on this well, together. Well, after two films, now you're a team. Now you've made you know, successful films and great collaboration going on, so are you looking for a third film to do together? How did The Departed come along? Rick? That's our manager. Yeah. How did that... <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know. Chris, Chris Donnelly actually gave me... It was a stack of scripts. I had to... Uh, Aviator did very well. Um, we weren't really looking... We were looking for a third film, but we didn't know what the hell it was. I, and I just wanted... What I wanted to do was a kind of down-and-dirty uh, uh, B film. I, I, you know, I'd had... I had had it with the aviator in the sense that, uh, in a good way, it was a spectacle. I wanted to make a spectacle in widescreen and aviation. I'm terrified of flying, so get in there in those planes and, you know, and throw yourself into it. And maybe that fear has that, that energy propels a lot of the, or uh, inspires a lot of the montage, so to yeah. speak, of the picture. Um, uh, and the textures of the plane, all that, uh, the sexuality of it. Um, uh, and the, and the, the mental illness was really, really strong for me. So. Having done that, I said, okay, now I, I, just, I just want to free myself and get and do a picture of these, just this street war, you know, a street war. And I mean, I didn't know that until I read the script that Bill Monaghan wrote of uh, The Departed. Um, I was uh, somewhat familiar with Infernal Affairs, but um, Hong Kong cinema and the uh, police are different in different parts of the world. So it's um, uh, not necessarily very different, but... It's a different kind of society in Boston, the Boston police, the New York police, all this kind of thing. And so um, uh, I just liked uh, the sense of the, of the script. And uh, you'd heard we were going to do it, and you jumped in. I think it was sent to both of us at the same, same time. time. Our manager would clarify that, but I have a terrible memory. There were a couple of other scripts, too. It was like the, the actual attack of the, the, act, the real whale that attacked the real whaling ship that Moby Dick is based on, but uh -huh. I don't realize I'd never get out of that picture. <laughs> <laughs> they never, they never, I'd be d gone. <laughs> the boats, they didn't forget it. So, yeah. But the thing about it, I, I would love it, I, you can't, sometimes, it, but the thing about it, this one was like, yeah, we could shoot this quickly, it's Boston, and we could uh, make something really strong, and a film that didn't give a damn about anything. Just start it, right, start it right with street violence, racial violence right in the street, the actual footage. You know, a guy being hit with an American flag because he wanted to go to school, you know? And so this is, this is a new sort at the same time, and then you said, you're yeah. in, and it all started to develop this that is, way. Uh, to, to always to do, to do dream scenes. How does one do a dream? And uh, I think what Sir Ben Kingsley mentioned to uh, Michelle one day, he says, she's a ghost. So he said, where'd you come from? In other words, if you're going to go in the scene, usually an actor has to know, well, I just came in from the street, I went up the stairs, I opened the door, and there you were. But we don't show you that in film. But where does the ghost come from? Where has she been? You know? Um, and so it's very difficult for actors, I think, to, to stay in a dream state. And what you did there is so beautiful. It's very, still very moving to me. 
the scene. And I designed the shots, moving and tracking in and into cutting. So who is? But she is. If she's gone, they says, I have to go, I have to go. And he can't hold on to her anymore. Um, and uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's always a problem doing a dream scene. I always find the, probably the most realistic way of shooting because a dream is very real. But these, this scene, this particular scene had other elements. The, uh, the ash, the fact that she disintegrates. And so uh, it really, for me, was their faces was the whole thing, the faces, yeah. yeah. Now, so Wolf of Wall Street was developing all through this period, I guess, for, for many, many years. And so you, this is something you wanted to do for a long time. Uh, yeah, I, mean, obviously. I, I think, uh, right, as you mentioned before, right about around the same time we had gotten the opportunity to do Wolf, but I, I feel like, you know, Marty really wanted to make this an, an American epic. And simultaneously, he, if we're gonna do a film that is putting this, you know, very dark part of our, our culture up on screen, a very comedic one at the same time, but a very sort of, you know, these characters that are essentially uh, incredibly narcissistic and, and uh, uh, you know, are just, uh, have no moral compass, you know, we wanted to push the envelope with it. We wanted to be able to, you know, portray their lives in an authentic way. And I feel like, I think he got a little resistance from the studio initially, and he kind of backed off saying, look, if we're gonna do this film, we gotta do it the way it should be done. And we kind of agreed, and the whole thing kind of went on ice right around, and we, we ended up doing Shutter Island, and went on ice for a while. At which point, you know, I had a couple opportunities to, um, do it with other directors and it was kind of got down the road with them and right when it came down to commit I just said I, I couldn't do it I had I really had to have him do it I really had to because you know um, we knew we weren't taking on precious American literature here we knew we weren't taking on the great Gatsby for example we were we we're trying to put this culture up on screen and there's nobody that I knew that through the character that would give the actors enough time through their characterization of these people ultimately tell the story and that's what Wolf of Wall Street needed it needed somebody that took the time to allow the actors to breathe to experiment to improvise and come up with these moments that are the fabric of the story uh, there was a lot of uh, concern from uh, the studio and the studio system so to speak for each word, each, uh, the sexuality of it, the lack of a, the violence, uh, all of this, the racism, all this sort of thing. And I just didn't know if I could do it again, if I would have the energy to just go through it again. So ultimately, you pulled it together over these past uh, few years where you, you were able to get uh, Joey McFarlane and, and uh, Riza and uh, uh, Red Granite to be able to finance the picture with total freedom, meaning Yes, we'll have, we'll go overboard in the sense of the excess of what they're doing with the language and the sex and all that. And ultimately, to have the trust to be able to shape it, you know. But we had to have that freedom in a way. Uh, but it couldn't be done with the studio. That was too much for me. You mentioned energy. I, mean, I got to say, most directors who've been making films for 40 years, 45 years, something like that, maybe their films get a little slower, get a little more stately as they get older. Uh, this has more damn energy, or at least as much, probably more energy than any film you've ever made, which is saying a hell of yeah, a lot. It does, yeah. I mean, you must have the same energy that you have to make, to make a film like this. How well, do you that, get that, was, every... that was one of the reasons I didn't want to do it, yeah. because um, I know when I get on the set of him and Jonah and every Margo, and every, they're looking at me in the morning, and I'm terrible in the morning, and I, you know, I can't, it's hard to get through the day, but I, they would give me this, this extraordinary excitement and we just go, and we worked, we had an 87 day schedule, and we shot in 87 days. Uh, but uh, know that I knew I had to, you know, I knew I had to be there, but not only that, uh, it's after he finished, I had to live with it with Thelma and myself yeah. for another 10 months, 11 months. Right. And then, uh, you know, it, 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 you have to, and that's when you really kick in, in the editing room, that's when I kept telling Thelma, ferocious, God damn it, ferocious. Let's kick its ass, let's go. Throw it in, bang, cut right in the middle of it. Let's, well, it doesn't match, it doesn't matter. They don't care. I mean, the, the characters don't care. What, are they gonna have continuity in their brains at that point with that many drugs? Why should Martin, we deal Martin with that? Do you do some of those five minute speeches 30 times? I mean, how, do you, how do you do a scene like that more than two or three times? That was the speeches that was, to your employees. That was a very interesting, I, I had, I've been thinking about these, these, these speeches for really like six years, because to me they were like, you know, Braveheart speeches, but they're war cries for greed and debauchery. And 
you know, persuading his coworkers to go screw as many people over as possible. So there were these, these twisted, um, you know, war cries, and I, I'd been thinking very meticulously about how to do them. I'd, I'd planned out each line. We, we had a rewriting process. We kind of limited it down, and I honed it in. But it was something about being on that stage, and even though I knew that every single person there was sort of paid to applaud and cheer me, you felt like you were, you know, Bono. You felt like you were a bona fide rock star that was there to, and, and it just, the, that was a, a very compelling, interesting moment. And I felt closer to what he must have felt like, somebody that had, you know, crossed that line of, of, of tr you know, being honest with himself as far as what he was doing about breaking the law. and. and slowly crossing line more and more and then persuading a gigantic group of people and in a sense creating a cult for himself and having to uphold that cult with a sort of surge of energy of lies and 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 it and I felt very close to Jordan at that moment how he must have gotten lost completely with the, the audience there. The, the incredible scene Leo where you're trying to find your car and making your way to your car. Oh! I mean, it's, it's this. Well, I, I'd like to know because you know everyone's grabbing. Who was that? Who was that? Was that Jerry Lewis, Jacques Tati? You know, uh, Buster Keaton. You know, first of all, what what might have been examples for that? Because it's just one of the most brilliant pieces of slapstick and, and, and comic acting I've seen. And then, how many times did you shoot that? Is, is another one. But what, so, what was your inspiration for the scene? Who 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 did you think about when you? Uh, I thought I had a guy on YouTube that I watched. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 was, it, it was entitled "The Drunkest Man in the World," <laughs> but it was it was inter It was not just the fact that he was, you know, sort of elasticated and trying to get. It was his motivation which really intrigued me, <laughs> because there was nothing. He had one singular uh, goal, and that was to get a beer out of the Seven Eleven. And it took him a half an hour, and he was writhing around the floor, just trying, and the guy's watching him, and people are scratching their heads saying, what are you doing? And he just wouldn't stop reaching for something that was a life-sustaining force for him. And, that, and I remember Jordan describing to me when I was talking with him about the, what it was like being on Quaaludes, because I've never done it, and, and he, he said, look, you think that you're operating the same, but the mechanics <laughs> of what your brain thinks and what your body actually physically manifests are two entirely different things. So you think you're a normal, logical human being that's got, you know, uh, that is, you know, walking forward, but you're doing something entirely different. And I, I remembered this YouTube thing, so I sort of watched that obsessively. And then, and then it became kind of like a 2001 Space Odyssey thing. I was this primordial beast crawling get, towards get this to futuristic space yeah. machine. Yeah. But the way Marty holds it, it's just this shot. wide shot. And, and he just waits for me to crawl there. It took forever, though. You had to, yeah, and you had it. It took like oh. 10 minutes for me to writhe over to that. Yeah, we trimmed the head of the shot, yeah. I remember. And, uh, that was and then, very... of course, we didn't realize that the car oh. door went up this the way. The car door know? opened up. It didn't go this uh. way, so I had to figure out how to get my yeah. so Should I try with my foot? That. And that's, that's when he reminded me of Jerry Lewis. Yeah. Uh, Jerry doing that thing with his body, because he's very long. And, and then when he got in the car to answer, then I had to cue the phone to ring in the car, just at the right moment when he finally got the door open and he relaxed. And suddenly, ring, you know, and he goes, oh, and he gets up and he crawls into the car. And what, I, what we didn't plan on, but was perfect, was that his feet were outside the car, mm -hmm. outside the door. And so the car looked like a face, like the face and the two feet were the conversation that he was having on the phone with his wife. Where are you, you know? And so all of that just held a shot. I did, like, we did only a couple of takes. And I but, said, that's it, there was no coverage. But that was the shot. You, he, had, he had shot listed that entire sequence oh, to yeah. a T. I mean, he, this was one of your favorite sequences yeah, yeah, in, the, in, the, yeah, yeah. in the entire film. So the whole rig where I sort of fall down and smash my head. The, the idea that, you know, which took a lot of practice to get the idea that I would speak in a normal language the other guy on the other line would react, say, what the hell did you say? I can't understand you. Then he'd cut back to me and be like, you know what I mean? That, he, had, he had planned that quite meticulously, every sort of beat of the, that shot. The it use was, of a medium frame as opposed to a close-up on yeah. that, uh, using the wider frame is better in a comedy. You know, it's the old <laughs> No, the truth thing. is that I, I suppose I've always been fascinated with wealth in America. It's about, to me, it's been about the the American dream and the, the sort of corruption of that dream. 
And coming from, you know, where I was brought up, I always sort of, I went to a school in Beverly Hills and I always sort of looked at the other side of the spectrum. And it's been a fascination of mine for a long period of time. And certainly since 2008 and what happened with the economic downfall, this film in particular was something that I, I really, this, this element of our very culture was something that I wanted to put up on screen. Gatsby, of course, is a, is a, is a you know, they, they have similar motivations. They both come from the underworld. They recreate themselves. But, you know, putting this culture up on screen is something that I've been wanting to do, you know, for a long time. And there, I think Jordan, in a lot of ways, is a, um, you know, he's the antithesis of Gatsby. He's, his motivations um, come from a sort of reptilian part of his brain, whereas, whereas uh, you know, Gatsby's doing it all for love. You know, it's, they're, they're two entirely different motivations. But certainly since 2008, this was, uh, this was something that I, I felt uh, we needed to explore the darker nature of humanity within this character. These characters that have, you know, complete disregard for anyone except themselves and their, and their, and their own sort of uh, greed and lust for power.